Welcome mural and public art enthusiasts to the debut episode of Muralism, where we dive deep into the vibrant world of mural painting and the artists who bring our city walls to life. I'm your host, Elliot O'Donnell, also known as Askew One. From my early days immersed in the Auckland graffiti scene to haphazardly finding myself in the international mural festival circuit, my journey has been a colorful evolution. In 2009, I shifted my focus to large-scale mural work coinciding with a decade that witnessed an unprecedented surge in monumental art globally. Having traversed the world, painting murals that tell the stories of the people and places I've encountered, I've now found a home in Portland, Oregon while working as a dedicated murals agent for BNA in the bustling heart of New York. In this podcast, I'll be bringing you the stories behind the art, the inspiration, and the incredible artists who shape our urban landscapes. Our inaugural episode features a dear friend of mine, who, similar to me, found his path in fine art and mural painting via graffiti. Vizzy, who originally hails from Houston, Texas, is currently based in Connecticut. His artistic journey weaves through the tapestry of graffiti, illustration, and breathtaking large-scale mural work. His murals are a striking blend of graphic grids interwoven with loose abstract forms inspired by the imaginative drawings of his two daughters. Join us as we delve into Vizzy's story exploring the roots of his creativity. This is Muralism, where we unpack the stories, inspirations, and process behind the public art. So there's a few threads I want to pull on today, sure. just as far as trying to get you know, people familiar with your story and your journey to this point. And the first thread is obviously graffiti because it's like you can't separate you from the graffiti stuff. That's like a big part of your story and how you got to where you are. Yeah. And then obviously you want to go then more into your art making process and kind of how that relates in conversation with your, you know, large mural scale, scale you know, large scale mural work and, okay. um, and just kind of how you do all of that. Because I think those well, I think all three things are very in, much in conversation, but I want to kind of find the through line. Sure. You know, if yeah. You will. yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. yeah you, you you started off painting graffiti, so from from Houston, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, when when did that journey begin for you? Mm, let's see. I think I was just talking about this recently. So, I I think I was in middle school at the end. Like, I, I guess. It, eighth grade is probably the time where I started. I, my friends all used to like skateboard and that was kind of like the first kind of like subculture thing that they were into. And I could never skateboard. I was never coordinated enough or like that physical to do it. So, you know, I, I like the artwork of skateboarding so that I, I don't think that was like, conscious as to that being tied to graffiti but it kind of came later but i would always like you know i'd like the t-shirts and etc but then from that everybody kind of found escape or graffiti and i was like artistic so for me i was like i could do that like while you skateboard i'll like tag the curb or whatever <laughs> whatever the hell Sk- skateboarding the gateway drug that's right that leads in this scenario, kids to graffiti that's true. That's which right. often leads kids to doing much worse stuff be careful parents <laughs> yeah absolutely so um eighth grade like excuse my ignorance because yeah i was gonna I grew up with a com- it's probably completely a lot different school existed. from uh from yeah from country to country so uh i guess high school is right after eighth grade basically and so it's like you're still in like the middle there um yeah so it's like just kind of before high school i got into yeah and uh and so what what did the i mean if you don't mind describing the houston scene at that time what it, it really looked like because i i've sort of i know little bits and pieces but it's, it's so that. it's for a big metropolitan city it's extremely small like um I just don't really know what to compare it to because I, for even as the whole time when we were there, it's just like, there's was always, I would say like, you know, a dozen people doing graffiti for like, and it's probably one of the, you know, third largest cities in, in the country. So, um, or I don't know, you know, I might be wrong about the exact number, but, uh, it, it's a big city and, you know, for that population, not many people writing graffiti or kind of knowing about it, you know, probably more now, but still 
pretty insignificant to a lot of other scenes. Um, you know, there was gang graffiti. I kind of like grew up looking at that a little bit. Like I, that's what I thought graffiti was first. And until like, I had a friend who had a cousin in Vancouver and he like went to visit his cousin in Vancouver and his cousin like drew him a graffiti shirt with like colors and a, like a piece. And that was the first like piece I had ever seen, you know? And so we just it was like, oh, like that's also graffiti. It's not just like doing like an old English or something. That's kind of what I learn or it's like what I knew of or, or whatever like and then from there you know at that time it was all magazines and stuff like that there was one graffiti shop I kind of grew up in the like downtowny art district area and there was one like hip-hop graffiti shop like I'd say like 10 blocks away from my uh my middle school or whatever and I'd you know, after school, it was like, we were probably the most annoying kids, like, you know, every day just going in there and like, just looking at the same things that they had, like every day. I, I, I think it's like that when the media is kind of scarce, you know, because we're still talking about a time when there was pretty much just, you know, internet, the internet was just becoming part of the story at that yeah, time. Like, you know, that even like came late for or, sure. It wasn't around yet at that point. Like it definitely was part of like expanding my graffiti. But at that point there was no internet or like, you know, I think not even at that time, like art crimes, the website wasn't even a thing. Like, right. Right. It, yeah. It's interesting because um, the way, I mean, cause there's always been a strange connection between, you know, the Australian, the Brisbane scene, you know, and the, and the Houston scene. And right. so from my understanding, that's because of damn it, you know, was based out there for a period of time as brother Jade. Yeah. And I've always sort of, um, and I know that there was this kind of this thing because you guys were all crewed together and I sort of had been led to believe that you guys had all kind of like, uh, not, not started out together, but maybe that they were kind of pioneers somewhat in the scene there. And you guys were just kind of starting out. And, and connected with them or how absolutely did they yeah so um you know i don't i don't well definitely don't want to downplay some of the other people in the scene so um, because they're pro even people who like kind of are still around like some of the other significant people but i would say that i think it's because of the connection to australia that uh damn it and jade were able to kind of like explode a little bit more like they're, basically, their their dad moved back and forth, and I think Jade stayed behind in Houston. I think he was like, "I like it here. I'm going to stay." And damn it, would go back and forth between Australia. And he basically like go to Australia, learn things, and then like apply those things to Houston. And it was just like it was like an alien landing or something, you know, like so out of place, and like just blew everything out of the water. And that was like what I grew up looking at right and it's like him kind of changing everything and then then we started you know like how you do you kind of meet people and start like vibing with them or whatever and you know like i think sean my brother was really you know like looked up to that and was just like like i want to do that and i want to do more and so they were at the time where they you know i think we we met and we painted together a little bit and then like Dana had come back with a few other Australian guys and they like really exploded everything and took it to, it was like a competition almost, you know, like how to do bigger and better things just like all over the city. And as opposed to just kind of just like, damn it, kind of like doing a random spot or like, it was like, that's kind of when I think it really injected into the Houston scene. What sort of things mentality wise did they bring kind of just from that Australian mindset into the, into the Houston scene? Because, you know, my impression when I first met your, your brother, your brother struck me as having a lot of the traits of Australian writers, mm. maybe because he was pretty criminal. Like a lot, a lot of them are very I, I criminal. Think, well, that, you know? that probably had a big part to do with it is like how you acquire enough supplies to be able to like do constant graffiti on every scale. Right. Like how you can like 
steal enough paint to be able to like do a piece in the day, go paint all night long, paint freight trains, and then like do a big roller. And it's like, you know, when you're just kind of like body racking or whatever, like stealing little bits and pieces here and there, you, you can like, you can get it done, but it's just like, the, there was this like step that like damn it brought like about like his racking ability and it also became part of the competition, like how much paint you could get. And like, so that really like exploded everything too. So even, even the way your brother dressed to me was reminiscent of like, you know, what, what they call searches like over there, at least the guys that I knew that could get away with looking very clean cut, wearing a lot of designer brands, Yeah, you know, sort of so that people wouldn't maybe sort of think twice about what they were up to. Yeah. I mean, just... that definitely got um, developed as the years went on. Like Sean's, uh, you know, I have these pictures of him where he's like wearing a vest and like a button up blue shirt with like a Bluetooth earpiece. In, and you're like, <laughs> I mean, it was awful to see, but you know, like, uh, it, he really got, he really did like to like play up that part to like, yeah, do our dual life. Absolutely. So the two of you, like, so there's a couple of years between you guys, but I was always led to believe that you actually got into the graffiti aspect of things before him, even though you're the younger sibling. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely i think i don't really know what it was just like my me and my group of friends kind of got into it and then like he we were both artistic right and so he kind of would draw stuff too and then i think there was just something about um i don't for whatever reason or for whatever it just like really clicked in him i think i think you know he was kind of a little different growing up like he would get picked on and like he didn't kind of like vibe with people and he was kind of an outsider he would like he'd get beat up when he was young and like stuff like that and so i think graffiti and him being able to like take over in this way it you know i don't know you know what came first about it but it basically like the i think the anonymity really like was able to give him this way to like step up or something like just the way that he could like ex explore it more, you know, or I don't know. <laughs> I just would always think about it too. Like once we were really into it, I kind of always, and maybe even as a personality, you might understand this. It's like, I would be like, I would paint for fun and I would do things that were fun for me. If I'd see a spot that I liked, I would do it. And he'd be like, we have to go do this tonight. And I would say, like, I'm not, I don't, you told me I have to go do it. I don't want to go do it, you know, like, <laughs> but it was a mission for him. Like he, for sure, he had to like, he had something to prove with that. Um, and I, he did. So, you know, yeah, yeah. He, he, took that, he did that, you know, probably until he passed away, you know? Yeah. So my first awareness of you guys was really during the mayhem crew era. Uh, it was the first time that I remember seeing you guys um, in magazines. And there was a, you know, a connection, obviously, to New Zealand via uh, Scream, who is a, you know, an, an interesting character from our scene because he came from an era also pre-internet where people used to write letters yeah. and trade envelopes and photos. And so he was like the very first person from New Zealand that kind of did all this outreach um, and kind of connected a lot of different artists and was one of the early guys to travel and kind of connect with people overseas. And yeah. obviously, you know, sadly, like, you know, it was pretty tragic because he was in that car accident with Nace where Nace passed away and he sustained really serious injuries himself that have kind of plagued him for life. Uh, and he had a second car accident a year later. Right. Um, but he was talking about you guys and from his stay in the hospital, uh from after that accident you know pe a lot of people had either sent him sketches or visited him in hospital and drawn his book and uh, there was a ton of photos circulating around and they were all ta and mayhem mm -hmm. crew like photos and stuff that i was seeing so we were sitting in paraparaumu in new zealand where he's from in his house looking through his expansive photo collection and seeing right. all your guys work there too yeah yeah and it, it seems to be a moment that's kind of maybe even a little 
I think American writers are very aware of that that era. You know, you and 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 Sean and and uh, Pose and others. You know, yeah. Um, but it's, it's 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 yeah. It's an interesting time. I just wonder if you could kind of speak on that kind of time. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a weird time to talk about because I would say that that week into weekend is like a yeah changed the course of like so much <laughs> because of, so that week was like this thing called scribble jam which is an event like a graffiti event that happened in cincinnati and uh run by this guy jacer who used to he used to do he used to do scribble and they it was like a big hip-hop event or whatever and i think it was the first time that we went you know he kind of Jason knew a bunch of people through the magazine and they kind of would all come. And so I think I was about to go to school in Kansas city. Um, and I hadn't met Pose at all or anything or any of those guys and they were all living there. Um, and so this was probably, I'd say a week before, like the car crash was about a week before school started, before I was moving from Houston to Kansas city. And so I met everybody at Scribble Jam and, you know, Sean was doing his thing. He's like painting a bunch of spots and like trying to like be the most Sean like up or whatever, you know, I don't know. <laughs> like he, I, I remember the way he met uh, Jordan or Pose is uh, he was like, had just come back from painting a billboard and Jordan was just had driven it all night and got into town in like three in the morning or something. And my brother like popped out of some bushes with like paint all over his face. And like, <laughs> I think he was going, I don't know what was going on, but it, uh, that's like how they met like on the street outside our friend's house. And they're just like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? And, but yeah, it was kind of like we, that's when I met, when I met Pose and like all the people he knew and, we kind of hung out that whole week and into the weekend we painted a bunch and we yeah nace was there and it was like all those kind of new jersey guys i think that year that was the year that the like msk was there i think gk had just got out of prison he was there um like it was a big like a pretty crazy year i'd say again at least for me you know it's super impactful for like what turned into like the rest of my life i guess um so, and, you know, Scribble Jam went great, whatever. And then, um, you know, we were all hanging out and I think, yeah, I left. And then like, when I got home, like found out about Nace, Pat, like passing away, getting in a car wreck. And then I think he was out there with like, uh, our friendship seven. And I don't know, I forget who was all in the car. I think, um, I think it might've been Chip seven and um uh nace and is it nezum from tokyo that's right nezum <laughs> yeah so because they had all painted that year and then um so basically yeah nace passed away and it just kind of like exploded everything because pose at that time was like friends with nace from going out to the east coast and staying chip and basically chip i think was kind of like destroyed by it and he just was like i'm moving to kansas city too like i gotta get out of new jersey like this is like his life totally changed and so we all kind of ended up in the same place right like we all landed in kansas city and it was just kind of this time and place where we had like a free-for-all basically <laughs> descended on a city un that's unknowing and kind of just really painted a ton and you know walls graffiti illegal stuff and i don't know it's it is definitely like a Im important part of like the story for sure like that week don't, in the weekend don't you think it's really fascinating how it's like a flash point and a connection point for so many people um i find it still so bizarre how all of our worlds have kind of kind of been introduced and and then kind of collided after that point you know what i mean even just when you list all of the people who were there yeah. we're now like i mean most of us are all crew with each other mm -hmm. totally. uh, now you know like 
and how many years on is this? It's 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 twenty plus years, you know. Um, but it seems to be a, a very pivotal moment in somebody who I didn't know personally, but was obviously a connector, you know, and sort of connected a whole bunch of people together, sort of, you know, in a way. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, they, it's like I think tra like Trav was there that year, like, and that was like when Trav. Was, kind of came out onto the scene or whatever like that was to me at least and uh yeah i don't know yeah i i agree it's it's a it's a strange moment in time that kind of like did change change a lot yeah. i mean yeah i'm still friends with pose like pose and i mean mostly everybody so the so after kansas city so now i know that Pose was studying art in Kansas City. Were you studying there as well? Yeah, we went. Sure? We went to the same school. I mean, I I think I I don't I'm not sure if I even knew that um, when he when I applied there. Or I think I had like I just I think I just knew kind of Kansas City had a little like graffiti scene, and it was one of the schools like it was had a good reputation. Um, so I had applied there, and then um, I think when I met him basically it was like oh yeah I, i've been going i don't think he even went there the whole time i think he had just started the year before and he had been there about two years at that point um so yeah we yeah, we ended up being in school together and our whole world just like kind of got meshed together <laughs> yeah were you you were studying fine art there or, or design uh fine art yeah i mean i i I actually went to like an art high school, so I kind of had like a already like an intro background to like whatever your like intro to art would be as like a first year or whatever. Um, and it, the first year is still kind of like a continuation of that. But then I think I, I went into like printmaking uh, more so because the printmaking department there was a little loose with their um, like they were like you didn't have to do printmaking if you were in printmaking. You could do like whatever you wanted. Like as long right. as it was, it was more a conceptual place, like where I mean, you might find it more in like a painting program and other places. Like what's painting? Like it's very loose, you know. Um, that's yeah. kind of how the printmaking was viewed, at least to me. So, and I had a little. I wanted to do like screen printing and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. Do you think that in any way um, that printmaking as a process or an aesthetic? You know the various aesthetics of printmaking have fed their way into your way of thinking about you know color and form still because i can see it but yeah i mean i don't know I, I feel like there's just yeah certain things that i kind of like do that probably i've just done forever um i don't know yeah like applying paint to things is done in a way that's probably like the layering and um I don't know the some of like the flat forms and things like that but i don't know i don't really think about it but it's it's in there somewhere no absolutely so you've lived in a number of major cities so you know obviously from houston you spent your time in kansas city um so if, so how does the timeline go from here because i know that you spent a, a period of time in the bay area and um and then out to new york city yeah so i think Kansas City was kind of, it got weird. And, um, you know, like we, like I was kind of mentioning, we kind of like all came to this little city and started doing a ton of stuff. And that really, you know, caught the attention of, uh, we, you know, did the wrong things to the wrong buildings and got in trouble and brought lots of heat on ourselves. And um, as, as one does. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Sean being, like a big, big part of that. And um, so, so I, there was a time there where I, I kind of like, I stopped painting and really, it was kind of like, what am I doing uh, here? And I, I got more focused on the fine art stuff. And I kind of got into that a little bit more. Um, but I think at, at that point, I just kind of realized that I was, I needed to get out of Kansas City. And it was just like, it wasn't doing for me what I needed. I needed, I needed something bigger, basically. Um, it still gives me anxiety 
like Kansas City because it's so like in the middle of the country. Um, and I, it's like being in outer space or something to me. <laughs> um, what, but, what year was it that you wound up in San, was San Francisco? Yeah. yeah so so I, kind of base? I basically like left Kansas City and went back to Houston for a year and nothing really happened at that time. I was just kind of like in limbo. Um, and then I had like reapplied to school. So I left, I left school before I finished in Kansas city. And then it was like, all right, I need to like kind of figure it out. And I had originally applied to California college of art. Um, and I got in as a freshman, but I think I didn't really know anybody there at that time. Um, so I ended up going to Kansas City because I thought it would be, you know, I'd have more of a community or a connection or something. And then funny enough, I met a bunch of people over the years of being in Kansas City from the Bay Area. And so I think it was just kind of like natural to then go there. Um, and a bunch of my friends live there and it's just kind of ended up out there. And you know, I think I was painting a little bit. I wouldn't say that I, I was doing a ton. Sean, Sean was still painting a lot. Uh, and that's kind of like he moved there to paint. And I kind of went there, went to go to school. And but I was I was like into photography. And that was kind of my I was like, I want to go here because there's like a little like there was a little like photography graffiti scene kind of intermeshed there. Um, there's a magazine called Hamburgerize. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's yeah. like a, it was like a black and white photo book zine thing, and I was kind of drawn to that. And uh, the photographer uh, Dave Schubert, who just passed away, he was like shooting a lot of the people I knew, and me kind of getting into photography and that kind of like scene, like party photography. Basically, um, I was like. You know, like when you see somebody, you're like, I want to put myself next to that person. It's kind of that's so that was another thing that drew me to the Bay Area. Yeah. And um, so what was like, how many years were you there? And then what led you to then relocate out to New York? Um, yeah. So the I think I was there about two and a half years, maybe three. And um for me, it kind of was like, I was still kind of on the path of like fine art. Like I had the fine art mindset or like, I was like, I want to do gallery shows and I want to like do conceptual art. And that's kind of where my mind was. Um, so that's where I thought like, the, like kind of, you kind of learn that a place like San Francisco isn't, it's not in LA or New York where they have like these scenes where you can kind of like, break through or work even just like working in galleries or things like that like san francisco is a big city but it, it, at least at that time it didn't have that type of scene so yeah. um so i thought you know that would be the next i didn't really know a lot about la and so i i i think again i had just had more friends there and uh my brother did end up moving out there a year before I did, before I finished school. So I, I, I it kind of was following him, but I think I was just going to end up there anyway. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what, what part of the story does the kind of whole MSK thing happen? Like where you guys connect and, you know, with those guys and how did that happen? Yeah, it's, it's, I want to say, actually on the way out to driving so driving from houston to san francisco to move basically my brother like i was supposed to drive with him but i got like hurt and like i had a knee injury and i had to stay behind to like go see a doctor and he was driving out uh with our roommate at the time and he connected actually i think with pose and revoke were out in la and they, so they had stopped there on the way to San Francisco and they kind of like, they painted a spot. I, I think I've got pictures of it somewhere, but it's like, that was kind of the first time they all kind of got together. And that to me is kind of like the, the point 
of like the starting point, really, I guess the connection with Revoke. Um, but, you know, it, we didn't even really meet like kind of everybody after for a couple of years. Like we go down to L- like my brother go down to L.A. or we go down to L.A. a little bit, but and then hang out with some of the guy. We had kind of like a different friend group in San Francisco than kind of like the MSK guys. It was more like a like punk rock graffiti people. And, you know, I, I, I didn't meet Steel until like a week before I moved out of San Francisco, which was like funny because they're like, okay, great, cool. Nice to meet you. I'll see you later. (laughs) Um, But um, yeah. And just, I think through that and just like, yeah, it's hard to say really exactly. I think it was always some, you know, I think for my brother, again, his mindset was always to like be the biggest and the best and that my MSK probably would be that for graffiti, I'd say, yeah. at least at the time, if if not now still. But um, so, you know, I think it was always his goal, at least to be on their radar. So and again, put himself next to the people he wanted to be painting with. So and then, I, you know, you saw over the years him and uh, Revoke's like relationship really like blossomed and they really mm. vibed and like did a whole thing yeah yeah i mean they really they had a partnership yeah for a few yeah. years there you know that was super productive and i did did you know one of those road trips with them right we, we we drove across the country but we swung by and picked your your brother up and that was my my first meeting with him and then he got a car in chicago um, and, yeah, and then we, me and him drove. He was like, you're coming with me. I want to get to know you. Yeah. <laughs> and then I hopped in the car, and he put on NPR. And I was like, do you want to listen to some music? He said, no, me and my brother have a rule that whoever drives the car gets to pick what's on the stereo, and I want to listen to NPR. I was like, okay, so we listened to NPR <laughs> for, like, the whole drive to Detroit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but, no, I mean, you know, he, he was only sort of, like that for a short period of time you know he warmed up very quickly and i sort of realized that he was kind of a, a very curious and social and and funny character quite yeah. daring you know he like liked people yeah you know I, again i think back to what we were talking about it's like he had a put he put on a rough shell i mean he was had a, and he was an intense person but like he definitely had he had like two sides and it was like very tough or like super soft. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> his, his, like, I have one of his uh, iPods and it's like the most sensitive music and then like the most illest like gang gangster rap. And that's it. There's nothing in between. <laughs> nothing. Yeah. And that's very representative of his uh, personality. <laughs> that's pretty wild. Eh? I think like, a lot of things happened in a really short time period. So sort of around the time that you guys got down in MSK, I think the big pivot towards the kind of professionalism in graffiti, the large scale mural scene popping off the festival circuit, paint sponsorship, a lot of these things all kind of just sort of happened, you know, around the sort of 2008, 2000 sort of 10 period. Right. And then from there, you know, like that's sort of a good way to segue into like your work outside of traditional graffiti and kind of where you went from there. It was a good springboard point, you know. Um, Yeah, let's talk a little bit about your process, like, and kind of like, you know, where that work's gone and how you conceptualize that work and how you've sort of come to that kind of creative outcome. Sure. I mean, um, I think... So just to kind of talking about that time period, I'll I'll go quickly because it you can get I can get stuck there. But um, I just <laughs> I think there was a time where I was in New York and I um, I basically was there living with someone and then we broke up and I kind of was like said it and she was very involved in the art world and I was heavily involved in like maybe a more like gallery art world or I wanted to be. And then like when that relationship kind of ended, I was kind of like set adrift. And 
I long story short, I went to Chicago and I was working for Pose and kind of saw what he was doing and he was having his first like gallery show really. And I saw what he was doing with like graffiti and like kind of like traveling and painting and, and the sponsorships and stuff like that. And I kind of used him as like a guide, I guess. Like I was like, I want to be where you are. Like, how do I do it? And so I kind of just, I started painting more again. I, and that was more fun for me. I realized too, I was like, oh, like this is what I want to be doing. Like I want to be, you know, like I'm seeing more of my people, my community, like, you know, even going to Miami and just like painting graffiti pieces. I was just like, that was supernatural for me. And I was trying to do something very unnatural by trying to like just focus on maybe more traditional like painting or like something that would fit in a gallery. And not that it didn't have anything to do with my like life as a graffiti writer or something, but it was pretty disconnected. And maybe the, like where you talked about the threads between what I do, I did not feel like that was there. Like it was definitely separated. So going to see kind of like what Pose was doing and like I was working for him as an assistant and kind of just like watching and trying to learn what I could. And I think eventually from there, just like found my own voice at using kind of this similar medium or whatever, like of like graffiti. And then as far as like, it took probably took me a while to like figure out what kind of like mural I would do or even like what art I would do as like a, like a busy artwork it kind of took a while to really form what that was going to be. Yeah, for sure. But I think that there's certain motifs, like I think color palette wise, you've always had a really distinctive use of color. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've always embraced kind of some of these really loud kind of like, kind of, um, what do you call it? Infrared kind of like fluorescent yeah. kind of red pink color, like in this painting behind you, the purple and the aquas you you had another motif that kind of i still see a lot in your work which is this disco ball mm -hmm. motif which has kind of become more flattened into a, a grid like there's grids in all your work you know right. it's funny yeah, I mean, because that's something that clients seem to be kind of like really responding to at the moment which is interesting yeah so, and it's it's one of those things too that you do for a while and then like I'm definitely at a point where I'm kind of moving away from it, but mm. I can definitely just talk about what that is or what that kind I'd of I'd love to know. Well, yeah. Interesting enough talking about what we just were talking about is trying to find the connection or like what's going to, what's like a thing to really like act on that represents like me as like this, you know, because uh, I think a lot of the like fine art, work that I was doing was like trying to touch on maybe like a you know more of like a city or like a gritty kind of like nightlifey type of artwork basically and um so I was trying to I guess touch on that point with using something that was representational of that but then more of a stylized of like what like a busy version would be right and so like I thought I I was always kind of drawn to like a disco ball because it is a it like crosses all like like you can have a disco ball in like the dirtiest filthiest dive bar and then have it in the ballroom of like a, a fancy hotel you know it's like it it crosses everything and it's just like a it's like a beautiful shiny object that like activates the room or whatever but it you know it kind of lives in all these different ways but i and i kind of was always you know, liked the like bars or like nightlife, things like that. So I thought it was a good representation of that because it could kind of live anywhere, right? So that, and just as an object, I was always, I always thought they were pretty cool. I mean, and then it is kind of like, it's kind of retro, but it's still something that's still around and people use them and I don't know. So. No, absolutely. And the interesting thing is like how I mentioned, they've sort of become flattened out yeah. into like a grid. And so you have all of these kind of grids which should enable you to kind of block color in very specific ways that can work with different architectural kind of 
features and everything mm -hmm. but then obviously now there's this other layer which is this interplay with this kind of really loose freeform kind of sense of line and shape and uh, from my understanding a lot of that comes from being a parent and kind of collaborating you know first with your oldest daughter and now with with both of your daughters yeah so um <laughs> i i guess again from from what I was just talking about, the like the vessel of the disco ball is like something that can contain or like um, is a good structure to start with for for everything, and then and maybe representative of like a, the life of like a young or like nightlife type of person or whatever. It's I don't know how to describe that or whatever, but um, and then kind of like that transition to being a parent. And like what you're leaving behind, right? And like you having to like change that and like adapt to this new thing, and then kind of trying to find the connections between the two, right? And so my kind of you see like the shapes and like the squiggly lines, or um, and kind of you know like trying to like you're 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 home with your kids and you're just like you kind of are constantly evaluating, like, you're like, how did I get here? Kind of, and you're like, <laughs> what, you know, like I used to do all sorts of things. And then, you know, like you're sitting there and you kind of just start to like watch them. Right. And like, watch what they do. And, you know, I saw the like marks and stuff that they, she would make. And I just was really envious of the, like the shape she would get. And like, just cause she could just, it's just like a full free form motion of, of a child. Right. And it's like, try, and you also trying to like, be like, not coach them or anything, just like watch what they do. And just thinking about that as being like the beginning and the, the, the life. And like, that's their little, like, that's their little graffiti or whatever, you know, like that's their little expression as far as even them, you know, writing it all over your apartment walls or whatever, you know, like <laughs> you see a little scribble at like eye height and you're just like, okay, like. You can't, you can't come down like a ton of bricks <laughs> because yeah. she's, she's eventually going to get old enough to understand that you're just being a hypocrite. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, there's, there's this one work. Um, it was a public art piece in New York. Um I forget, I forget the artist and I have it. I'm, I'm just bad with names, but, um, I have, I have it saved somewhere, but it was like, it was this old graffiti lot, um, down by canal. And, uh, I think basically before they like had put a building there, they had like the, a public art fund, like put up this project. And it used to be this crazy lot with like fill-ins and all sorts of stuff. And, uh, the artists basically like they did a scribble, and then they just painted it ginormous across this whole, these two buildings. And I was always like, that's perfect. Right. Mm. Like, I don't even know if it was the artist representation of like the graffiti, like, cause, mm. but to me, I was like, okay, that is like, instead of like being like, this needs to be graffiti. It's like, this was like a bunch of people scribbles. And like, now there's like a giant scribble across the whole wall. And so I kind of made the connection from that to the murals right like i was like okay well i'm having this connection with my 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 daughter and her artwork and her like scribbling and i was like trying to think of like her it's like her, of her graffiti you know kind of and i was like okay well like that's that's a good connection and that's how i can use, use that as like that's i can put this on a huge building and like that's like our like collaboration and that's our connection and that's my connection to like being a parent is like watching her make these marks and what you know like she's my child and like taking that and just like making a new thing out of it do you um i mean because obviously she's of an age now where she's obviously cognizant of of this that dad dad kind of takes these things i do and interprets them and enlarges them and, and goes off sometimes for a couple of weeks at a time you know to i don't know to india or something and and, and paint something or to you know prim nevada or you know some random place and and and, and does this 
how like how does that conversation go with her <laughs> now like you know i it's definitely something that like i thought was gonna be this like big thing in our relationship and i not that it's not and not that it won't be but it is funny because definitely sometimes i you know i'm like hey look i'll show her a picture of this building and she doesn't care at all you know like <laughs> it, it's it's like if you you're parent is a movie star and you yeah. they're in a movie and you're just like i don't know that's just you doing that thing that you do like yeah there's there is i wouldn't i'm not it's not like a letdown or something but it is just funny you're like all right okay <laughs> like you don't really care right now yeah totally and, has, has she shown a kind of like um is there a, a, a draw to the arts for her or not really yeah i mean for sure like she um her my oldest daughter is definitely like constantly drawing and um i think again just because we are artistic artistic parents it's like if not that it's fully encouraged it's just like it's definitely not frowned upon so like we let her do her thing and so i think it's something that she likes to do and she yeah you know it's just, it's all developing too and it's all kind of getting more representational and which is cool to to see that yeah like happen. yeah absolutely but now i have like a younger one so i still have like the scribbles but also have like some shapes and stuff too so. yeah it's interesting i found it really inspiring and obviously you know i have an almost 20 month old daughter who sort of seems to be really drawn at this stage of her life at least towards art and music music yeah. probably even more so than art but she does technically take up about probably 40 percent of my studio space with her little mini studio within the studio yeah. <laughs> at the moment has an easel has her own paints has an apron can come down here and make as much mess as she wants and yeah. we have collaborated too like i thought you know that's great like we, we collaborated on a mother's day yeah so yeah. it was really nice to like see kind of her little mark making and you know also too just like the variations from like what your kid does with what tool and yeah the different types of drawing it's like every oh she's a mad lady she's an absolute mad lady like when she she, she gets into it she has to have music blaring <laughs> while she while she draws yeah. if the music stops she looks at me and she's cross so yeah I put it back on yeah and she will do like a really intense scribble and then she'll dance around the room look at it come back and add a little bit more so it's <laughs> full body yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's really something man like i you know I guess you just kind of capture that moment while it's happening and enjoy it because it's sort of, as you say, you know, it, that may not have any bearing on her kind of future path and interests, you know, but it's, it's a wonderful thing to share right now. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I, and again, like it also very, it's all varies from kid to kid. Like yeah. our youngest daughter is a maniac too. Like she doesn't, the way she draws is completely insane and, totally different than the other one so yeah. do you see par parallels between like you and your brother with your two two children how mm. contrasting they are personality wise i haven't quite put that together i mean that's a lot it might be for like the therapist to figure out <laughs> yeah true, i haven't true. Quite, sorry no, no, <laughs> yeah, I probably, probably was a weird question no well i mean i don't know my my youngest is kind of like outwardly a lot like wilder but you know i don't know i think definitely sean like my brother as go growing up he was like quieter but then he kind of became more intense as we got older and i kind of sat in the background so <laughs> yeah, right. so your um we we talk a lot, like kind of just about your your sort of goals and aspirations with your work, and yeah. you know we've definitely kind of settled on a few things that we're really into focusing on. One of them is like high traffic areas, looking at things like you know like subway stations and you know busy kind of street kind of areas, airports as a possibility. Yeah. Thinking about larger kind of developments, you know, and like how your work would look. You know, which you've already done, like kind of wrapped right around an entire building or 
on multiple surfaces, like looking at basketball courts and things like that, but also all the things that kind of surround them and that. So yeah, yeah, I wanted to kind of just talk a little bit about about that and sort of how you see your work kind of fitting in that space. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's it's a question that kind of gets asked a lot too when you're like doing public art and like like why it deserves to be in the public eye. Um, and I don't necessarily have an answer conceptually why it needs to be, but I, I just think it's like, it comes very natural to me to make work that's like big and in public. I think coming from graffiti, it's like something that's, we are drawn to for sure. Like if given the chance, like how to activate a space. Right. So like you, I, I can see a building and it's like, if you get to do whatever you want on this building, like how is that going to work and how is it going to like make the space around it, like frame it and look nice. And I guess that's just, that's my immediate kind of connection. I think is just like having it be a part of the landscape and like, I don't know, just, I feel like I know how to do how to do it, right? So I I I think I don't know. I, I, I stumbling a little bit on the question, just more because I've been thinking about it. So I'm I, yeah. I'm still like kind of figuring it out. But I, I guess just because it's like it's it's a natural thing for me to do. Like I I I probably have more trouble trying to figure out what to do on a canvas than I do having how I, having to like make something on a huge building would it's so funny because i think actually a lot of people like from our particular you know sort of scene probably feel very similarly yeah to you in that respect you know it's 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 a weird thing because it's like you know a lot of what we did we went out and we kind of had to adapt very quickly to a set of circumstances you know and be really responsive to an environment and i think that's given us a particular kind of lens or a modality, a way of kind of like thinking about work that when it becomes too introspective and small and focused, if it's just a small square sitting in a space that suddenly it kind of like, I don't know, that feels really stifling to me as well. Yeah. You know, because it doesn't have the same energy and it doesn't feel as kind of much of an, an intervention. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely like harder for me to go inward and smaller than it is for me to like imagine something very large and just like ma uh, making a statement that way mm. and i think again like what i do too I, I try to keep it keep my my work at least kind of abstract enough that people can kind of read into it what they want and it's not too heavy-handed with imagery so it's like i think it works well in the public eye because it's like it can be decoration or it can be mean something you know um and so you know when you are in the studio i think you're scrutinizing every little aspect of it because it has to be something i guess yeah and it has to be um perfect yeah in a way that sometimes um you know outdoor spaces are a, a slight bit more forgiving yeah and i think the i just it's part of it right like painting the thing is part of it so it's like it just get coming to life in 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 the city space or in wherever is just like it is part of the process of the piece um so like when you're in your studio it's just like you know i could work on a painting for a year or it could <laughs> But it's like with a public art or something like that, it's something more that's just like it's got to happen quickly or it needs to just take shape. And I don't know, you're battling in the elements, et cetera. So, yeah. And, you know, there's always a, t a time limit because, you know, access equipment costs money. Getting things permitted right. costs money, like having a traffic management plan, you know, and, and organizing a street closure or, or coning off an area to yeah. have your lift parked or whatever. It, it all has a real cost and time factor, you know, associated with it. So 
I think sometimes that additional pressure is quite healthy. I wish I personally had that same feeling of intensity for my studio work. And maybe that's why I never really make much until I've locked in a, a show. And I'm the same way. The same, it's hard for me to just like pressure. meander around the studio and um, kind of make work. I, I need to be under some sort of timeline or pressure is, is helpful. You know, again, back to like graffiti, it's like that's how we kind of learned how to make work, right? Like mm. we we learned how to like kind of like scout locations and how our things would look. We we drive around the city visualizing it, right? Like you like imagine your what you're going to do in a certain area or how your thing will look in a certain area. And, you know, for the most part, that's how you like are involved with the world and so like yeah it that when so so like public art when like these kind of projects come up you're just like i i can see it and i can see how to make it happen and like let's do it let's get it done like and you kind of go and you knock it out rather than like just having all the time in the world or i don't know i mean i know i I, just kind of talked in a circle but um no no i think i think that's that's definitely true and i don't know i feel that there's something really kind of cathartic about that process too that i really like i i love having a, a tight window i love the, the stress of yeah, as yeah. bad as that sounds i really really respond well to it you know being under it under the the pressure you know of it all yeah um, interestingly enough it's something that um being a parent is uh it, it it's helpful in that too because um something that you don't have a lot of is time and so like a way to like make something or like like you there's more pressure and your time is more precious and it's just like for me it's helped activate me it's helped like kind of put the fire under my butt to like you know make certain things happen and kind of like I, I just, I kind of, I guess, relate it right to that, um, just to that feeling, right, of just like being pressed for time and what you can do with that time and, and like how to figure it out, I guess. 